Okay, we're going to get started. This is Robin Priestley from the Ramsey County Historical Society. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. We're so pleased to be able to partner with the Eastside Freedom Library with the Ramsey County Historical Society, of which I am the um, member and marketing manager. So again, thank you all for coming. I also want to thank there's several members in our audience. And I believe there's also some members of the Eastside Freedom Library here, people that um, come here often. I want to thank all of you for your support, both for the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. If you are interested in being a member of either organization, Peter and I can help you after the program. As a member of the Ramsey County Historical Society, you get this wonderful quarterly magazine. You also get free admission to our Gibbs Farm, our historic site up on Lumberdale, Cleveland, and a ton of other great benefits. So I also want to bring to your attention some of our upcoming programs. Peter can talk about the programs here at the Eastside Freedom Library. But on July 26th at the Roseville Library, Christine Potus Larson will be talking about the Floating Bethel, which will be a really interesting talk. The Floating Bethel was a home that was actually a boat that was on the Mississippi River, and it was for the river workers, their families, children, and etc. So this was for the poor people of St. Paul, and her great-grandmother was the person who founded that. So it should be a very exciting talk. Um, next August, on August 1st, at 7 o'clock is our next program here at the Eastside Freedom Library, Queer Voices. We're going to have a panel discussion on the book put out, Queer Voices, and that will be extremely interesting as well. Then on August 8th, David Page, who wrote the book on F. Scott Fitzgerald, will be at Waldman's Brewery and Worcestery. So there's a whole lot of programs coming up with the Ramsey County Historical Society at various locations. I have handouts over by the books over on the table. And they're also on our website, rchs.com. So again, I have a, some magazines. If you haven't seen our quarterly magazine, feel free to pick some up. And Greg's book will be over there for purchase. I'm sure he'll be happy to sign them afterwards. Peter can tell you more about Greg and the book. But again, on behalf of the Ramsey County Historical Society, I want to thank all of you for coming and for your support for our programs here in partnership with the Eastside Freedom Library. And here's Peter. Thank you. So um, if this is your first time here, um, just want you to know the restrooms are downstairs. Um, we do have a guest book, and hopefully you signed the guest book when you came in. Um, there are books that Greg will be signing after the event, so we encourage you uh, to get a copy of the book. Um, I want to introduce Wendy Johnson. Wendy, stand up. Yeah. So, after Greg wrote this wonderful book and we began trying to find someone to publish it, uh, we were not terribly successful with our first couple of efforts. And on Tom O'Connell's advice, and Tom, and here is Tom, here is Tom O'Connell himself, uh, Tom had published a, a book with Wendy's assistance. Her project is called Elder Eye. Um, and if you have, if you're sitting on a book manuscript, that you would like to publish yourself. Have a look at how handsome this book is that we've produced and um, talk to Wendy and, uh, and publish your own book. I had lunch with someone today who was thinking about it. So, so do get a book from Greg uh, afterwards. There are also uh, some refreshments. Um, so afterwards we hope that you'll partake and uh, stay and socialize a little bit. Um, I just want to mention upcoming tomorrow night here, uh, we will be celebrating the 85th anniversary of the 1934 Minneapolis Teamster Strike, um, showing the film Labor's Turning Point, uh, and there will be a panel of people talking after the film. So that's tomorrow night right here at 7. And on Saturday night uh, at 7, um, if you have been following at all, uh, the news from Ethiopia in the last month. Uh, there was a coup attempt, a young new president um, who had made peace with Eritrea and, had, and was himself of both Oromo and Amharic uh, ethnicity. 
Um, he was the target of a coup attempt, but he survived. And we will have a panel of people from all the ethnic groups in Ethiopia talking about what's going on there and how they're making sense of it. And so join us Saturday night. Saturday night's not always the best night for something like this, but they were in a hurry to get out in the public and talk about it. So Saturday night at 7. So I, I want to introduce Greg Gao. Um, when we started talking here at the library about getting a book written uh, about our history, um, Greg Gow was the first name that came up. Greg had written a wonderful book about the Laird Library in Winona, um, and he was available. Uh, and so we drafted it, and uh, it's been a great process, and we are absolutely thrilled um, with the outcome. And um, I hope you all get the book and can read it and find out both how great the book is and also how interesting the history of this library and this neighborhood uh, is. So I'm going to turn things over to Greg. Well, uh, I get this. I think you should start these kind of talks with a lots of thank yous. And uh, and I really, um, you Rashla, Beth Cleary are really the, the main people to thank. And also uh, Clarence White, who works here also, and has been so helpful. Tom O'Connell's already been mentioned as someone who helped get this process going, and I was going to have Wendy stand up, too. I won't make you stand up again. But uh, really, um, the, Wendy uh, designed the book, designed the cover, designed everything about it, copy edited it. I mean, the whole look of the book is, uh, is because of Wendy, and we really appreciate uh, working with her. It's been really great. However, when you write a book, there's lots of other pieces of involved. So here's what I want you to do. When you pick up a copy of the book, even if you just want to look at it for a minute, go to page 125 which is the acknowledgments page, which, by the way, is the most important page in every book. And see all the other people who helped uh, get this book written, and I really appreciate it if you do that, uh, because it, it, was, it was really helpful. And uh, also, uh, we need to thank uh, you, the, uh, the taxpayers of Minnesota, thank you very much, because uh, the book was funded by two uh, grants from the uh, Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. So thank you also for, for helping out help, help with this. Um, there are probably some people in this room who have memories of this building in its various stages, and if you do, uh, when I'm finished with my talk, if you want to share any of those memories, that, that would be great. It could be really very interesting. Now, here's what I want to do. This book is about one branch library in one neighborhood in one part of one not very big city. It is what you might call a, a work of local history. But it's a local story that connects with all sorts of bigger stories, national in scope. And this single building has played and continues to play a role in many of these big national stories. A, a, a small building like this can open a window into many larger stories. So rather than summarize the book, what I want to do is to highlight uh, some of those connections, some of the ways in which this building that we're all sitting in connects with some larger stories. So the first one would be... Just speak closer to the mic. Answering the question. The first one would be answering the question of why do we have public libraries at all? And the reason I like to start with that is because Everybody loves public libraries, and everybody takes them completely for granted. W weren't they always here? Or didn't they just you know, come with the territory? No, they did not. They had to be struggled for and built, and it was a long uh, process. So originally in places like St. Paul, there were libraries, but they were not public, free public libraries, tax supported free public libraries. They were what we call subscription libraries. They were private, you had to pay a fee in order to take books out. Sometimes they had public reading rooms, but basically they were, they were not public uh, free libraries. And so there was a national movement, see this is the first connection, a national movement, you could call it the public library movement, in the 19th century that pushed all around the country to get cities and towns uh, to fund free public libraries. And the problem was, as you may know, cities can't do just whatever they want to do. They have to be authorized by their state legislatures to be authorized to tax for a particular thing. So the public library movement struggled to get states 
to pass laws authorizing cities to create free public libraries. Minnesota finally did this in 1879. In 1882, the St. Paul City Council uh, created the first, or created the, the free public library of St. Paul. So now we have a free public library. Before that time, there was a thing called the St. Paul Library Association, which was the subscription library. And they were part of this public library movement also. Part of this movement to try to get the city of St. Paul to create a free public library. While they were struggling to get that done, they did a lot of fundraising. That's how they kept their subscription library going. And one of the ways they fundraised, which was very interesting and very much part of the late 19th century, was by bringing in famous lecturers who uh, gave lectures that people would pay money for. So in big concert halls and opera houses, etc., famous people would come to Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, and they would fill up the lecture hall, and the St. Paul Library Association would make some money. There were people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Wendell Phillips, Susan B. Anthony, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the most famous of all these people, if I can get the, the uh, uh oh. <laughs> Um, help. <laughs> Wait a minute now. There we go. Thanks, Clarence. Uh, just your presence helped. This was the most famous of all those lectures, uh, Frederick Douglass. And he gave lectures in St. Paul in 1867, in 1869, and in 1873. The first two were for the Library Association. In other words, he came and gave a big lecture in downtown St. Paul to raise money for the St. Paul Library Association. In the last time he came, in 1873, to St. Paul, there was a problem. He was denied uh, a room in one of the hotels downtown St. Paul. It was a big brouhaha in the press. Eventually, it was all straightened out. He did get the room, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that night, when he was uh, going through this little hassle about accommodations, which, of course, happened to Frederick Douglass all over the place, uh, the speech that he was going to give was a speech called Composite Nation. <clears throat> and it's just amazing to me because it's a perfect speech both for this library and also with respect to some things that have happened in our country just in the last couple days. Yeah, so let me just read um, a little bit about that from the book. So ironically, the lecture he was scheduled to give that night was entitled Composite Nation. A stirring call for the United States to for the United States to embrace its destiny as a multicultural society. In particular, Douglas defended Asian immigrants against the racist backlash of those years. And this is a quote: "I want a home <coughs> here, not only for the Negro, the mulatto, and the Latin races," he told his audiences, "but I want the Asiatic to find a home in the United States and feel at home here, both for his sake and ours." The only wise policy, he argued, was a liberal and brotherly welcome to all who are likely to come to the United States. As is often the case, Douglass's words seem fresh and timely and an inspiration for libraries of all kinds. But when I wrote that, I didn't realize how fresh and timely uh, that quote would be. Uh, but that was Frederick Douglass and very much sums up a lot of what he was saying in those times. I want to just say one other thing about those early days of the public library movement, maybe. <laughs> The public library movement, the creation of public libraries in Minnesota and really everywhere else, was really the work of women. The public libraries were created by women. The, the library boards were mostly men. The people who actually did the work and make it happen were women. And there's two people you really should know about in Minnesota, Gracia Countryman and Helen McClain. Gracia Countryman was the um, chief librarian in the, uh, for Minneapolis. She joined the staff of the Minneapolis Public Library in 1889 and became head librarian in 1904. Helen McLean uh, was the chief librarian in St. Paul from when it started in 1883 to when she retired in 1917, 34 years. And the thing about these women was not only did they um, manage these library systems, but they were passionate about growing the library system. So the idea was to push the library system out of the downtown into the neighborhoods, and Gracia Countryman was also concerned more with, along with her uh, partner, Clara Baldwin, who worked for the state, for pushing library services out of the towns into the countryside. So they're working on all these things, trying to bring library services to everybody in, in the state, no matter where they live. And so this was a, a, quite an achievement, and Gracia Countryman and Helen McLean should be remembered for being really key parts of this. And that brings us to 
The second part, second question, what I call in the book the first reinvention, which is basically the creation uh, of branch libraries. So when these first free public libraries were created, almost everywhere they tended to be just one library downtown. Oftentimes it was in rented space. And then during this period, of course, in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, America was changing. So now we have another big national process going on that's going to involve the library. We have this enormous European migration to the United States, to Minnesota, to St. Paul, and especially to the east side. Here, it was Swedes that were the dominant ethnic group on the east side at first, but they were joined by immigrants uh, from Italy, Poland, other Central and East European countries, and after World War I, by Mexican Americans and African Americans moving up from the south. So, we have a changing situation that calls on the library to do something about it. This is what Gracia Countryman and Helen McLean were trying to do. Now, you probably know that the place where a lot of these immigrants first came was the famous Sweet Hollow. And I want to mention that Steve Trimble, uh, St. Paul historian, uh, contributed to our book. There he is. Steve, could you just raise your hand? There he is. Thank you very much. <laughs> contributed to our book. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, famous little piece he wrote several years ago called The Saga of Sweet Hollow. So it's actually in the book and it's, uh, it does a really nice job of giving some of the kind of the flavor and culture of what Sweet Hollow was like. It was kind of the place where people came when they first arrived and couldn't find any other place to live. And uh, it's obviously just a few blocks from here, and if you ever take one of Peter's walking tours, he'll show it to you in, in a lot of detail. Uh, up at the top, you see the Ham's Brewery, and over to the right, the uh, Jacob Ham's uh, uh, mansion. Um, and so uh, people wouldn't come there. Oh, by the way, I have another picture here. I just can't resist. In 1935, um, the newspaper man went into Sweet Hollow and got some of the Sweet Hollow kids to uh, pose for a picture. And this really has nothing to do with my talk, but it's an irresistible <laughs> picture. <laughs> I always want to show it whenever I can, because it's, uh, it's just charming. It gives you an idea of what, what Sweet Hollow uh, was like. In any case, what would happen is the Swedes went to Sweet Hollow first. That's why it was called Sweet Hollow. Other ethnic groups came after them. And as people became more prosperous, they moved up to the avenue, up to Payne Avenue, literally up, and also figuratively up. And Payne Avenue eventually became a very prosperous uh, place. And so we have, um, there we go, Payne Avenue in the 20s, when it was a, a thriving place. So the Payne Avenue merchants, mostly Swedish, thought that uh, the east side was really kind of its own place. It was like a city onto its own. It was kind of surrounded by railroads, cut off from the rest of the city. They thought it had everything. You could buy anything here, everything you wanted was right here, except for one thing. They didn't have a library, because the library was just the library downtown. And so some of the, the uh, business people on Payne Avenue started campaigning for a library. The labor union started campaigning for a library. There was a push to reinvent the library and make it into a neighborhood thing, not just a downtown thing, okay? And so um, at first, the libraries in Minneapolis and St. Paul, other places in the country, responded uh, by creating what they called delivery stations in the neighborhoods. And a delivery station was a place where the library would leave some books and then a courier would come once a week to pick up new books, take orders, deliver books that had been ordered, etc. Sometimes the delivery stations were in schools, sometimes they were in workplaces, and sometimes they were in shops, especially drugstores. I have a picture here of um, the delivery station, I think is in a school uh, in, on the east side, somewhere in St. Paul, actually somewhere in St. Paul, uh, where kids would come and get their books that were delivered by a courier, and then the next week there'd be new books would come. So the delivery station was kind of a, um, a way station on the way to the branch library. Now, on the east side, the main delivery station eventually was Bodine's Drugstore on Payne Avenue. And Bodine's Drugstore was a partnership between a guy named Bodine uh, and, and another guy. Uh, named Victor Sundberg. There he is. Victor Sundberg was a pharmacist, a druggist, uh, but he was also a leader of the commercial group on Payne Avenue, and eventually he was also in the legislature. So he was one of these people who was campaigning uh, for a branch library uh, to be built on the east side. But how was that going to happen? Who was going to pay for it? 
what do you think? <laughs> so this is where we connect with the next part of our national story, how this little building connects with the big national story, namely Andrew Carnegie's remarkable uh, philanthropy. Another intersection between this building, this room that you're sitting in, and a big national story. So Andrew Carnegie, um, we might as well just <coughs> look at him, I guess. Uh -oh. There we go. And I wrote here, from the homestead strike to the gospel of wealth. So when you're talking about Andrew Carnegie, we have an incredible paradox to talk about. So Andrew Carnegie became really, really rich, uh, largely because of the really openly brutal way that he treated his workers, for example, at the Homestead Strike um, in 1892, where people were killed by Patriot Guards, et cetera, et cetera. When, when uh, Carnegie forced a 12-hour day on the workers there. On the other hand, uh, at the same time, even before the Homestead Strike, Carnegie had written these two pieces, which are now together called The Gospel of Wealth. There were two articles published in the National Magazine, where he said, well, he was already a really rich guy, but not as rich he was, as he was going to become, uh, that it was the duty of a rich man to give away all the money they made, that the money you made beyond what you needed for your family uh, to support them. And of course, for him, that meant supporting them in an opulent way. But nevertheless, to support them was basically held in trust for the community and should be returned to the community. And that a rich man who didn't do that, who died with some of that money, should, should be said to have died in disgrace, in his view. And then he said, what should you do with the money? Well, he had listed things, universities, concert halls, hospitals, etc. But for him, his favorite thing, first and foremost, was libraries. This had to do because when he was growing up, libraries were, and having access to books was really important to him. And so, uh, he was the one who made this happen. So, when you think of a Carnegie Library, you might think of a, a little small town, neoclassical building, and you pass through some small town, you see a little neoclassical neo building, you say, oh, that must be a Carnegie Library. And you're probably right. But Carnegie was also extremely interested in branch libraries. In 1899, he gave a grant to New York City to build 65 branch libraries at once. It was, it was probably the biggest single grant he gave. These were branch libraries spread out all throughout the boroughs uh, of New York City. He gave a similar grant to Philadelphia for not quite so many libraries. So in Minnesota, and by the way, I should say, overall in Minnesota, Carnegie gave grants for 65 public libraries throughout the state, uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. But in terms of branch libraries in the cities, two went to Duluth. There was a grant for four branch libraries in Minneapolis, and then there was a grant for three branch libraries, of course, here in St. Paul. And the city accepted the money and they had to decide which neighborhoods were going to get the libraries. A lot of libraries wanted them, a lot of neighborhoods wanted them, but the ones that came out on top were Arlington Hills, because of this really well-organized Swedish business community, etc. Uh, the West Side, and then St. Anthony Park. They were the three that were chosen to get to be the first branch libraries in the city of St. Paul with this funding from Andrew Carnegie. So Carnegie's philanthropy, as you might say, tainted as it was, completely transformed and reinvented the public library in the United States by making it possible to have libraries in all these little small towns and throughout the neighborhoods. And this is what we call in the book the first reinvention of the public library. And that brings now to the third question. Why do they look the way they do? Why do they look the way they do? The typical Carnegie library, in fact, I'll show you a typical Looks like this. It's a small, rectangular, uh, modest, but neoclassical building, usually one story with, with a basement, uh, central entrance up some stairs, classical pediment, you have the two columns. This is in Dawson, Minnesota, way far in the west. You take Highway 212 almost all the way to the Dakotas, you come to Dawson, and you'll come to this library. Now, this, is a, this maybe was not a good example to choose because it actually says Carnegie Library, <laughs> but they put it up there. But if, you, if that sign wasn't there and you were driving through Dawson and you saw this building, what would you think? Of course you'd think it was a Carnegie Library. It's your basic Carnegie Library. It's this basic neoclassical style, right? And so now we find that the three branch libraries that got built in uh, St. Paul were also a neoclassical style. 
Well, why did it turn out that way? Well, the person who was responsible for that, oh, I should say, before I get to that, although when you go through a town like this, you see that a little neoclassical building like that must be a Carnegie Library. There are Carnegie Libraries that are not neoclassical. So for example, this is the Detroit Lakes Public Library, and generally a kind of a prairie style, almost kind of a Louis Sullivan-ish kind of a library. So it was possible to build Carnegie Libraries that didn't look like that classic Carnegie Library. It was possible to build them in all sorts of styles. Carnegie didn't care. There was no mandate about that. But nevertheless, the three branch libraries that were built here in St. Paul were all neoclassical. And the reason for that, I guess, we have to go to this man, Charles Hausler, who was the city architect in 1916. Very young man, but he was a city architect, only in his 20s. The thing about Charles Hausler, he had a remarkable career. He was one of these architects that worked in all kinds of different styles. Styles didn't mean anything. He moved all kinds of styles. He did neoclassical buildings like Coma Park School that still exists up there. Uh, he, he built prairie-style houses, including the houses he lived in. Later in his career, he built the uh, Minnesota building downtown, an Art Deco building. And then he built lots of churches. And can anybody point out what that church is there? Anybody recognize that church? It's St. Andrews. Andrews. Yes, it's St. Andrews. It's of course designed by Charles Hauser. I could have picked a lot of churches, but I thought this was a good one to pick because it's very much uh, in the news. Uh, a Romanesque revival church, but he did Gothic revival churches, Byzantine revival churches, the guy could do all kinds of things. He could have designed these three Carnegie libraries in a variety of styles. They could have been prairie style buildings, for example. But he chose neoclassical. Why? Well, the first thing is, you have to remember that in 1916, 1917, there was this incredible fad about neoclassical architecture. Architecture based on, you know, generally Greek and Roman um, um, models. And this goes back to 1893 in the Chicago uh, Columbian Exposition when uh, Daniel Burnham built this whole white city on the Chicago lakefront and really pushed this idea of neoclassical architecture and it started this enormous fad. And for a long time, for 20, 30 years after that, people thought that every public building and almost every bank had to be neoclassical, had to have big columns or something, had to look like a neoclassical building in some way. So if you were going to build a public library that wasn't neoclassical, you could do it, but you're kind of going against the grain. This is sort of powerful fad that was going on. And Hostler knew how to do it, he could have did it, but he didn't. One of the reasons might have been that at the same time that he was oops, doing that, he was also in charge of uh, the construction of the main library downtown. He didn't design this building, but because he was the city architect, it would fell to him to be the superintendent of construction. So he was responsible for uh, executing this building that was actually designed by someone else. So this is another neoclassical building. It, it, it would, falls into the, uh, the kind of the wing of neoclassical design that you could call Renaissance Revival. Uh, and uh, obviously it's, it's a stupendous building. It's a, it's a wonderful building. And like every neoclassical building, you can see it's strictly symmetrical. It's one of the basic rules of neoclassical architecture. It's strictly symmetrical on its front facade. Of course, this building is unusual because it had two main entrances, because when James J. Hill gave the money, he, he wanted to have his own little private library there also, and you know, it's, that's also been in the news lately. Uh, so we have two entrances, but notice in between the two entrances, there is seven arched windows in between those two uh, entrances. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And seven is a really good number if you're gonna do something symmetrically because you have one in the middle and then three on each side. And so now when we go to the libraries that Charles Hausler designed, the three branch libraries, Riverview, St. Anthony Park, and this library, we see some real similarities. So here's Riverview. And notice those seven arched windows. The center one now becomes the main entrance, and then you have the three arch windows on each side. Basically also kind of a Renaissance Revival kind of look. Hip roof. Right. And then, keep in mind, all these libraries have exactly the same footprint, the same size. And then we go to St. Anthony Park, same thing. Seven arched windows, the center one 
being the door, of course, uh, pretty much a similar thing, hip roof, etc. But then, when he came to this library, Charles Hauser is thinking, well, I'm designing three buildings that are all exactly alike in terms of their dimensions, but, you know, I don't want to do this over and over again. I want to do something different. Uh, and so we get to uh, this library, and we get something completely different. Mm -hmm. So now we have um, still seven bays uh, across the front, but he alternates them between rectangular windows and rounded windows, rectangular windows and rounded windows, rectangular windows and rounded windows. By the way, uh, if you look at the bottom of this picture, you'll see the, uh, the uh, trolley tracks. And so you might wonder, isn't it kind of strange that this library was built on a side street? But at the time, the Payne Avenue streetcar went right by the front door. Because it came up Payne Avenue and at York, it took a, a, a right turn, jogged over to uh, Greenbrier, and then it went up Greenbrier because the, the grade on Greenbrier was a little easier for the streetcar than it was on Payne. So the streetcar really went right back. Now, I'm going to show you, it's a little easier to look at this. This is um, from Hauser's original plans. And I really, I was so happy when somebody in the city came up with these plans and was able to share them with us. So you see what he did, uh, again, uh, <coughs> alternating those arches and those rectangles. But then he does something else, which is that separating each of those seven bays uh, is a pilaster. A pilaster is like a column that's kind of embedded in the wall. Uh, and so the, the bays are separated by pilasters, except that on both sides of the central entrance door, there's paired pilasters. And at the far ends of the front facade, there's paired pilasters. So we get 12 pilasters all together. So we have really a much more uh, highly decorated uh, facade than in the other buildings. And so I ask you, which is the best design? Uh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can go backwards here. Okay. What do you think? So we have this building. We have St. Anthony Park. We have Riverview. What do you think? This, this building. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm asking the wrong crowd here, but anyway. <laughs> uh, you see what he did, I mean, the, the dimensions are exactly the same. They're all neoclassical buildings, but they're not, they're not quite the same. This one looks bigger. Yeah. This one? Yeah. That's more interesting. Yeah. Got more stuff. Overdone. <laughs> it's because it's over, overdone. Now that sounded like a critique. Uh -huh. Sorry. But it's okay. It's okay. The other thing you notice about the, uh, this building is that the other two had hip roofs. This had a flat roof, or I mean, there's no such thing as a flat roof, but a, you know, a, a low slope roof with a baluster around it. It's a little bit, little bit of a different approach to the roof also. Okay. Well, uh, in, in any case, um, that's how the buildings turned out the way they looked. They, they, they were part of really this sort of national movement for neoclassicism that Hausler decided to go with. And so we get these neoclassical buildings. Now, I want to say one more thing about uh, the design of this building before we move on to the next part of this. Uh, Carnegie and James Bertram, who was uh, Carnegie's secretary who ran the uh, philanthropy program for libraries, did not impose any style on the exterior of the buildings. But they were very interested in how the interior space was used. They did not want people taking their money and wasting it. And so they wanted all the space to be used uh, in a very efficient way. And, uh, and they wanted it to be used in a particular way. So what Bertram eventually did was he, he produced a little, this went on you know, for, from about 1899 to 1917, so he got better at it. He eventually produced a little booklet. So if you asked for Carnegie money, they would send you this booklet. And he'd say, look, read this booklet first and give it to your architect. And so what the booklet was, was not about exteriors, it was about interiors. And so, whoops, this is, um, uh, there it is. So this is one of the uh, interior floor plans for a small library, for a library about this size. So you'll notice over on the right, the first floor, he has, of course, the central entrance, just like we have here, the, the circulation desk, and then one whole side of the library is the adult reading room. The other whole side of the library is the children's reading room. Half of the, uh, of the main reading room is for children. And then in the basement, half of the basement is a lecture hall, and the other half is mechanicals and toilets and some workspace, etc. Okay, 
So what was happening was, is that Carnegie and Bircham were using these grants to push across the country, obviously very successful, 1,600 libraries they were, they were funding, some reforms in library design that were just then coming into play uh, that otherwise I don't think would have spread so quickly. And those, there was three of them. One was open stacks. So you notice these floor plans do not have any stack room, like a separate stack room. Because in early libraries, you would have to go to a desk with a little piece of paper, I want this book, and then the librarian would go back into the stacks. You couldn't go back there. The librarian would go back into the stacks, just like in a research library today, actually, and bring the book back out to you. But now we have open stacks. So the idea was the stacks, well, you can see them, would be all around uh, the circumference of the room, not a separate stacks room anywhere, not a separate wing for stacks. So that's one thing, open stacks, which is kind of democratizing the library in many ways, and also made possible this wonderful thing that all researchers know, which is browsing. That the book that you're actually looking for might be next to the book that you, <laughs> that you thought you were looking for. Anyway, you can't do that unless you can actually browse. That's one thing. The second thing was children's departments. So right about this time, people were starting to talk about, hey, children uh, should have a special part of the library. Not just a special part where that's just for them, but a special part where the furniture was different, the, uh, the decorations were different, and of course the books and the materials were different. A whole half of the library would be for children. And so Carnegie and Bertram were pushing that on people too. And then thirdly was the lecture hall idea, that every library would be a place where there would be not just books, but also programming of various kinds. Programming by the library, but programming by the community. All kinds of things could go on in the library, and, and very much uh, Carnegie was pushing that uh, also. Okay, now, four. What happens to a library over 100 years? So this is the hard part when you're writing a little book like this, because this library was built in 1917. Um, 2017 is it celebrated its centennial. And guess what? A lot of things happened over those 100 years in terms of big national and international processes that affected this library. So it's really hard to summarize those. Let me just mention a few of them. One of the things you should keep in mind about libraries everywhere was a constant uh, uh, pattern of growth. So libraries continually served more people, more people had library cards, more people borrowed books, circulation numbers kept going up, and the services that libraries offered over the years kept growing and growing and growing and growing. Obviously, that's kept going up until the recent times. Can you imagine librarians in 1917 sitting at that circulation desk? Could they have imagined that someday one of the major functions of the St. Paul Public Library would be to provide internet access to a large segment of the population? I mean, obviously, you could not have imagined that. Now it's a major thing to do. Or that you would borrow a book from the St. Paul Public Library by downloading an e-book. I mean, these were, so many things have happened. Uh, that libraries do that they didn't used to do, and it was a major uh, function of growth. At the same time, another basic pattern that goes on everywhere in this country is that libraries are always fighting for money. And every time there was a recession, the library budget shrunk, and that had a hard time getting back to where it was before the recession. The first time that the St. Paul Library Administrators talked about closing this library was in 1924, when it was seven years old. Then came the Depression. Yeah, and that was a tough time, too. After World War II, of course, things came back to life. Uh, but on the other hand, then this whole neighborhood took a terrible hit. So we had this huge process, which of course was national and international in scope of deindustrialization, consolidation. Ham's brewery was bought and then slowly died. Uh, Seeger Refrigerator emerged with Whirlpool and slowly died here. 3M, which started here, moved to Maplewood, etc. Pretty soon, thousands and thousands and thousands of well-paying union jobs that used to make this neighborhood run were gone. And that obviously began to really hurt the shops on Payne Avenue. So all this was happening. And then we have whole new waves of immigrants coming to this neighborhood. The mom, other people from Mexico and Central America, from East Africa, etc. So we have a revitalization now beginning to happen uh, in this uh, neighborhood, which obviously you just drive up and down Payne Avenue and you, and you can see it. I mentioned this restaurant that Peter's taken me several times, he's saying hi, etc. Uh, so all these things were going on and the, li the library then is struggling uh, with uh, struggling for funds, struggling to deal with new immigrant communities, etc., etc. 
and continuing to serve as best they can this changing neighborhood. Now, other things are going on too nationally. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. One of the things that, of course, starts happening in the 50s and 60s is everybody decides that things have to be more modern looking, right? So uh, in, in uh, this library, in 1958, there was a modernization campaign and so they actually lowered the ceilings in this library with acoustic tile. It's all gone now, thank God. And those uh, you know, egg carton uh, light fixture things are up there also. And there was new furniture, which I think some of it was pretty good, like these flop benches. Although, according to the newspaper, they were in bittersweet orange. It was 1958 color, I guess, and I would have loved to have had a color picture of that. But we did. Eventually, that was all reversed, and this, we got the ceiling back that we should have had, etc. Another thing that happened was that there was a recession in 1980, and this was probably the most serious time when this branch library almost was closed. Uh, there was a commission uh, signed to figure out what to do about this recession and the problem with money, and it recommended closing uh, Riverview, uh, Arlington Hills, and Hamlin uh, libraries. And then there's this huge community pushback in Riverview and Arlington Hills, et cetera. And, uh, Mayor Latimer decided it was not, not a good idea to follow the idea of the commission, and so the library stayed open with very uh, limited hours, but slowly crawled its way back. It was very close in, in 1980, 1982 to, to keep this place open. There were other things happened, though, that were better that, uh, in this time, national things that affected the library. One was there was a whole new attitude about historic preservation. So in 1966, Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act, which set up the National Register of Historic Places and all kinds of other things. And in 1984, this building was added to the National Register of Historic Places. And more importantly, the next year, 1985, it was designated as a local landmark by the St. Paul Heritage Preservation Commission, which actually gives it protection, which the National Register does, does not. And finally, Congress also passed another law in 1990, the Americans with Disability Act. And so now this is a whole other thing for Carnegie uh, Library because every Carnegie Library, uh, no matter what the style was, was very similar in that uh, it was always entered by a pretty significant stairway. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't make any difference if it's prairie style, whatever. And usually what happens, there are two-story libraries. The first floor is about eight feet above grade, and then the basement is maybe six feet below grade. So you can't get into either one uh, except through stairways, the way they were originally constructed. It's amazing to me how nobody ever thought about any of this uh, in those times. So the ADA was passed in 1990, and then slowly but surely, all these libraries and a lot of other places that were going to continue to uh, accommodate the public had, had to be changed one way or another. And it's really interesting to see how different libraries and different buildings dealt with it. I mean, there's various things you can do. You can build a great ramp, which fortunately that did not happen. Or you could do what was, what was done here, and maybe some of you even entered this way today, uh, which is that an addition was built with an elevator and a grade level entrance. And this happened at, at St. Anthony Park and at Riverview uh, Carnegie Libraries uh, also. So when we get to the 21st century, we have uh, these three Carnegie Libraries, uh, structurally sound, uh, handicapped accessible, uh, on the National Register, well supported by their communities, and, and everything looks to be hunky-dory. But um, we get to the last question, which is, uh, why isn't it a library anymore? Which, I mean, a public library anymore. It's still a library. Why is it not a public library anymore? Well, uh, in the mid-2000, 2008, 2009, the city started talking about how Maybe they needed a new Arlington Hills Public Library, but they also wanted an Arlington Hills, a new Arlington Hills Community Center. And the idea was to have the community center that eventually was built at the corner of Payne and Maryland. And the city had already experimented with this in Highland Park, that is to say, combining in one building a community center and a library and some other services so they all be together in, in one building. That's what the, the city wanted to do. And so they decided to do it, and they did do it. And so in 2014, that new library opened. Uh, and it's doing really well. And Tracy Baumann, who's the director of that library, is back there. We thank you very much for coming. And, uh, um, but the problem was then that the library uh, uh, withdrew from this building. And the city then uh, assessed it and put it on the market and was going to try it, was trying to sell it. And um, 
the prospects of selling this building to someone who uh, who had any sort of economically feasible plan was was really unlikely. I don't think it was ever going to happen. And so this library, this building, this neighborhood was now in a really dangerous situation because a, a building like this that is not used, it's essentially abandoned, even though it still might be owned by the city, is in deep trouble. Everyone who works in the historic preservation world knows this, that a, a building that's not used, slowly but surely, is going to deteriorate, it's going to die. It's what we sometimes call demolition by neglect. Because no one's going to put significant money into a building that, that's not being used, that they have no use for. So for a building, a historic building to survive, there must be a, what we call an adaptive reuse. Someone has to come in with a new use that was not going to continue to be used in the old way it was, and a new use that's uh, sustainable, economically sustainable. Someone who actually is going to keep doing the maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How is that going to happen? Well, here we come to one of the most <coughs> amazing moments of serendipity, right? Because at the same time, um, Peter and Beth were imagining a, a project which would allow them to contribute to the renaissance of the east side, which they saw happening. And their idea was to create uh, what they thought of as a free space. And so what I'm going to do to conclude is just read a few paragraphs from the introduction, uh, which talks about that and talks about that idea and, and why it's important. And then we'll be interested in your memories and your questions. So this is a couple paragraphs from the introduction. The introduction is called Our Free Spaces. We can take pride. Oh, by the way, I'm going to move to this last slide before we do that. Not that one. Um, sorry about this. We just have a little bit of a... There we go. That's what you're supposed to be looking at. We can take pride that every town of a certain size in our country has a public library. Big cities, big cities have downtown libraries which anchor a system of branch libraries spread through the neighborhoods. These libraries are tax-supported public institutions and their services are free to all. They are free spaces where everyone from a homeless veteran to a one percenter is equally welcome to spend the day. They are also free spaces in the sense of being classrooms of democracy. Places where the skills and habits of participatory community membership can be practiced. There have been libraries since ancient times, but the public library which reaches out and serves every citizen is a uniquely American invention. Traditionally, libraries have been warehouses for books. Our libraries today are first and foremost places for people. But we live in a time when all public goods are under attack. The commons, those things that we own collectively and can assess freely and at very low cost, are shrinking. And with it, our sense of community and interconnectedness. A powerful ideology of individual greed and corporate power is taking hold in its place. It pushes the idea that everything of value should be treated as a commodity, something to be bought and sold in the world marketplace. According to this ideology, commerce should be deregulated, public investment curtailed, and public goods turned over to private corporations. From that point of view, public libraries make no sense. They are, after all, based on sharing and cooperation. They are fundamentally committed to serving everyone without charge. As sociologist Eric Klanenberg argues, libraries are a crucial part of our, and this is his term, social infrastructure. The physical places that allow bonds of mutual respect and collaboration to develop between neighbors of different backgrounds. He includes schools, playgrounds, athletic fields, community gardens, churches, community organizations, farmers markets, and if they are welcoming, even coffee houses, barber shops, and bookstores. But libraries, he says, are the one place that has consistently promoted a modern ideal of mutual respect and enlightenment. And just a short re referral to the footnote here, I'm talking about Eric Kleinenberg, whose new book is called Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, the Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life. Really interesting book. Anyway, the introduction then goes on to talk about what we just talked about, the history of this library, and then the des decision of the St. Paul Public Library to leave this building. And then it says, this created the opportunity for a new kind of free space in the building that Carnegie contributed to the East Side. Historically, free spaces have been places where knowledge of how to nurture and expand the public good has been created and shared. Before the Europeans arrived in Minnesota, 
the Dakota had storytelling circles where elders passed down what they had learned, and this tradition continues today. Later, other kinds of free spaces were created, like the farmers' cooperatives that launched the Populist Party, the women's clubs and settlement houses that helped build a mass movement for suffrage in the early 20th century, the churches that provided the backbone of the anti-slavery and civil rights movements, and the union halls, which were the home base for worker struggles. Our shared history teaches that free spaces are a crucial building block of democratic life. When times are tough, we need to protect existing free spaces and build new ones. Another little footnote note before I finish this. This is based on a book by uh, Sarah Evans and Harry Boyd from a long time ago, 1986, called, of course, uh, Free Spaces. Yeah. Beth Cleary and Peter Ratchliff, two longtime East Siders, formed a nonprofit which negotiated a long term lease for the former Ellington Hills Public Library and created the East Side Freedom Library. This represented another reinvention of the library idea and a new kind of free space for the East Side. In addition to being a research library focused on immigration, labor, and social justice history, the new library hosts a variety of programs including music, theater, films, lecture, roundtables, and community forums. It is also a gathering space where trade unionists, immigrant organizations, and neighbors can share concerns, ideas, and stories. Over the years, the neighborhood around the library has been home to three waves of immigrants. Beginning in the 1850s, Northern Europeans built the neighborhood and the labor movement in St. Paul. In the 1890s through World War I, they were joined by immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Mexicans and African Americans began to move to the East Side in the 1920s. And more recently, immigrants from Central America, East Africa, and Southeast Asia found a home in the neighborhood. It is difficult for people to live and work together effectively if they don't know their own stories and the stories of others. <clears throat> the East Side Freedom Library provides a free space where these communities can research and share their stories. As the saying goes, this is what democracy looks like. Thank you very much. Anybody want to share any remembrances of this building first before we have any questions? Yes? This was my childhood library, and I would ride my bike over from Lake Phelan on the east side, and then walk in here in the sixth or seventh grade and ask the librarian, what should I read? <laughs> and she told me, she said, read The Milan Massacre, read Contiki, read Uncle Tom's Cabin, the story of paying in, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say thank you, Peter and Beth. Well, that was a good one. I mean, <laughs> 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 <They> probably, <laughs> does anybody else want to, or if not, just any questions anyone has or comments? Yes. Of the Carnegie Libraries in Minnesota, yep. how many still exist, and how many others are on the National Register of Preservation? Yeah. So I have those figures in the book. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of guess it from the brother. So there were 65 all, all together. 18 are gone completely. Um, 17 were torn down, and one was burned down. That was one in Walker, Minnesota. So those 18 are gone, um, and they tended to get lost in the 60s and 70s, back in the, the great urban renewal days, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of the remaining 40-some, uh, uh, about half of them are still uh, public libraries, and the other half have been repurposed for something else. Uh, there's, like the one that, that Dawson Library is actually a law office. Um, some of them are art centers. Some of them are used as county or city office buildings. Um, the, the problem with, with these buildings is they're, they're kind of hard to repurpose. Um, you know, as you probably know, all around Minneapolis and Minneapolis St. Paul, former school buildings get turned into residences pretty easily. Uh, but it's hard to figure out what to do with, with something, something like that. That's why I, I, I say this building was really in danger when, when the, the city left it, because it was really hard to figure out adaptive reuse. And then about, uh, I think there's, uh, of the 40, I think I wrote down from the 47 that still exists, 37 are on the National Register. So uh, uh, quite, quite a few of them are. So I should, I should say also that those libraries, uh, which there are about 22, I think, of the 65 that still exist as libraries, all of them had to be changed in significant ways. And obviously the accessibility issue had to be dealt with in all of them. <coughs> and uh, in, in most cases, they had to be expanded in some way also. Um, to adapt to new technologies and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I don't know. It's 
I don't know if that's a success or not a success, but you figure after 100 years, and for some of them are actually 115, 117 years old, uh, for that many to survive is maybe pretty good. And, and keep in mind also that this whole, like I mentioned, the National Historic Preservation Act was passed in 1966, and really uh, kind of a preservation consciousness about historic buildings didn't really take root until the 70s. And so, um, I mean, that's, that should be factored in also. So. Yep. How much of the county of knowledge here for each library? Well, so the way it worked is that uh, um, if you if you approached uh, Carnegie and you wanted a grant for your library, James Bertram would ask would send you a questionnaire that you had to fill out. And one of the things he wanted to know was what was the population of your city in the last uh, census. And basically, he used a, a rule of thumb of about two dollars for, for that. So if you ever were, were a town of ten thousand, uh, your grant was going to be twenty thousand, basically. This is for individual towns. Um, and if you you know if you were really a town of 5,000, you need to build a library for $10,000, which was completely doable, uh, but it wasn't going to be a very big library also. For branch libraries, of course, it's a little bit different, uh, because so what, for St. Paul, got a $75,000 grant to build these three libraries. So the idea was that they were going to be $25,000 a piece, uh, and, and they, that's what they were. So this is why Bertram was really concerned that he wanted to see the plans before he signed off on all the money, because he didn't want to see a lot of wasted space. Because he thought for twenty-five thousand dollars, you better be using every bit of space. What he was afraid of is people were going to build because they were in this neoclassical thing. They're going to build like some big entrance lobby with a dome over it. They, they would, nothing would go on there except you know big people going, oh wow. And so he, he didn't want that. He wanted every space to be used uh, efficiently. Um, and so like somebody said, well, we want to have a smoker in our library with it, you know. And they said, no, <laughs> you know, we're not going to have smokers in these. We're not going to pay for that. We, you know, it's going to be efficient use of space for the actual purposes of the library. So that was the general rule of thumb. Take your population and double it. Um, and there was a kind of a funny story, I thought, of course, from where I sit. Northfield uh, was a town of about, I guess, 10,000 at that time. And they, I, they wanted to, of course, they did get a Carnegie Library. And uh, Bertram offered them $20,000. And they wrote back and they said, well, wait a minute, we're, we're Northfield. I mean, <laughs> Haven't you heard about, you know, Carlin College saying, oh, you know, we need more money than that. And Bertrand wrote back and said, you're getting $20,000. You know, we don't really care about all that. If you guys are so, well, do it, fine, don't, you know. So they tried to, they're not, they, you know, he didn't budge on that. And it made it easy for him. Because he's just 1,600 libraries. He's cranking these things out. He wanted to make it simple. And so that's the way it worked. The, the other thing is, of course, the cities had to agree uh, well, two of the other things had to happen was that one is that you had to have a, the land in hand, and secondly, that the city had to agree, pass a resolution that they would support the library at 10% of whatever the total grant was per year. So if you got a $20,000 grant, you had to have a, a city resolution that would be $2,000 set aside for maintenance annually. And, and some cities actually turned the money down for that reason. They said, he's trying to you know, trick us into supporting our library. And, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned a little bit in your book the importance of the labor movement in supporting public libraries. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so there, you know, the, the, um, there's some really good evidence that uh, right here in St. Paul and in, in the labor newspapers they were talking about, uh, and there's an editorial I quote quite at length in the book about um, this problem where, where by the time we get these growing working class neighborhoods like in the east side, and now more and more and more people, the only way they can get library services if they really wanted was to make a long trek uh, downtown. And as the library, as the neighborhoods spread out farther and farther, that trek downtown got longer and longer. And plus, you know, you're working. So, you know, how are you supposed to do that? So the labor movement was really um, uh, pushing for the expansion of libraries in St. Paul and really everywhere in the country. On the other hand, there was other parts of the labor movement that was so pissed off at Andrew Carnegie uh, that they occasionally, um, like in Detroit, uh, you know, they, they held up the grant to Detroit for years and years and years. The, the labor movement just said, we, you know, we don't want that money. It's terrible money. It's tainted money. You know, it's stolen money, etc., etc., etc. So it was uh, there was places, and then and there's also over across the river in Minneapolis. Although Minneapolis took the money for four branches over there, 
uh, at one big uh, labor uh, conference, they actually burned an effigy of Carnegie <laughs> during the conference. Um, so this is a, it was a hard question because uh, everything the labor movement said about Carnegie was true, but on the other hand, he had the money and he was trying to give it to them. Uh, try, trying to give it to cities uh, for libraries. And so what, what should you do? I mean, should you say no or, or not? Um, one of the things that occurred to me about this is, you know, I, if you compare the way Carnegie was operating to present day wealthy people, one of the things I noticed is that what Carnegie was doing, I think, is not what many of these really rich people want to do now which is that he was giving the money directly to cities, and then that was it. Here's your library, now I'm gone. You, you don't have to put my name on it, many people did, you do not have to do that. And, and he, was, he, was, he was not trying to control what the cities did, except that they needed to continue to maintain their library. Which, uh, and so that, that was really interesting. He wasn't saying, I will give you all this money if you shut down all your public schools and only have charter schools or whatever. You know what I mean? This is not what he was doing. It was like a different kind of thing. It was building the public sphere rather than trying to shrink the public sphere. And he wasn't doing it. And there was no income tax, and so there was no, no uh, charitable tax deduction. Thanks, Jim. That's right. Yeah, that's right. No, he was doing it because he believed, and I, I think he did believe this, he tried, that it was his duty to give away all the money he had uh, um, before his death. But, and by the way, he failed because he was, as one biographer read, he was outrun by compound interest. <laughs> he, he kept giving money away quickly. But he had so much money, he was making so much interest, he couldn't give it away. Uh, uh, yes? Well, the other thing to mention is Carnegie came from poor means. Mm -hmm. yes. Very poor means. And so maybe that came back to him as he got older. That, that, that thought of how he started. Yes. Out. So he, you know, just to brief rundown, he was, he was an immigrant himself from Scotland. And his, um, his family were. Uh, Weavers and people who, whose jobs kind of got eroded by the mechanization that was happening in the textile industry. They were also all, uh, his, most of the men in his family were members of the Chartist organization, which was fighting for the working class vote in England. So he came from uh, that background, and so they partially they emigrated because their economic situation had gotten pretty rotten in, in Scotland as opposed to because of what was happening uh, in their industry. And so, yeah, he did come from that, and then he admitted that although, of course, he was a brilliant businessman, etc., that a lot of the reasons he became the most wealthy man in the world for a while was luck. You know, it was opportunity and luck. And so, therefore, he said, I'm kind of the steward of this money. Uh, but, of course, that puts a really wealthy person in the driver's seat in terms of what to do with it. And obviously, various things can happen. So, I think at least with respect to this part of his philanthropy, it was pretty positive. Can you imagine the, I mean, the American library movement would have grown, of course, but this was an enormous boost. 1,600 libraries built in this 20 year period that otherwise all these towns would have, I don't know what they would have done. It's hard to say. Yep. Somewhere I read or heard that the primary motive for his project was guilt yeah. <laughs> over his treatment of the working man. Yeah. Did you say any evidence well, in support of that? Uh, this is a, this <coughs> greatly debated among the biographers of uh, Andrew Carnegie. Um, so uh, I, I think there's, there is definitely some truth about that. I mean, in, in a general sort of way. I think it's it, it's harder to make the argument that he was it was guilt about the homestead strike in particular because he had really committed himself to this massive philanthropy before the homestead strike. But I think um, in a general sort of way um, that he um, I don't know if guilty is exactly quite the word, but he felt really uneasy with with what had befallen him with all this money and felt he needed to do something about it. Uh, he certainly would not have copped the guilt. He would not have agreed to that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question. If you read the biographies of, uh, of um, Andrew Carnegie, by the way, the most recent biography of Carnegie, I think is really very good, is David Nassau, N-A-S-A-W. Uh, he goes into this, this question, uh, and um, 
you know, it, like I say, it's, it's not simply that he felt guilty about something and then decided to give all this money away. He was sort of committed to that beforehand. I can, tell you, I can tell you being from Pittsburgh, the uh, judgment is still out. <laughs> <laughs> but think of all the things that Pittsburgh got, though. Oh, I know. I was one that was recipient of one because I came from a poor working class background. And my home on Saturdays, like yours, was going to the library. Yeah. That's where I learned how to read. And I didn't already know how to read it right. My yeah. mind got expanded. And that was his library. Sandy? Hi, Greg. Um, so you said some towns were reluctant because they didn't want to come up with the maintenance. So yeah. how did they supply the books and the librarians? Yeah, well, that, that, was, that was the town's duty also, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we usually, um, I should say there was, there was three criteria before Bertram would release the money. First, you, you already had to have in place a free public library of some sort. And so what mostly happened with these original free public libraries in St. Paul and everywhere else is they had some little rented space. You know, like it could have been upstairs, upstairs of a storefront or something. So they had some space, they had some books. They probably even had a library maybe of some, of some kind. But they couldn't make that next jump into their own building. And they just, you know, and the, the, the city councils tended to think that once they passed this, this statute saying that we're gonna have a free public library, that they were done. <laughs> that was, there wasn't anything else to do. And, People kept saying, well, no, you've got to build a building now. And, and they said, well, you know, they didn't quite get it. It was, it, it was kind of slow. Um, and people were saying, you know, this is kind of like the fire department. You, you, you have to supply these things. You can't. But it was, it was a slow go. And this is why, um, you know, that's why I say the timing of, of this Carnegie grant was really helpful. And, uh, but yeah, but the city's responsibility was still for staffing and books, etc. What, what Carnegie built was, was just these buildings. 100% for the building, but, but nothing else. Yeah. Yep. To kind of follow on with that, um, how is this collection developed and maintained? It's not a public library. The collection we're seeing right here? Mm-hmm. That's, that I'm not an expert about, but I mean, what, if you walk around, this is like much like I can tell you. You'll see on a lot of the different shelves the names of historians and other scholars, some of them famous, uh, who have donated their books or whose families have donated their books. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Peter donated his own books. A lot of the books. Peter, you got a lot of books. In the Mold Archives. And this is the Mold Archives back here. Yeah. More books than the Arlington Hills Library, huh? Many, many times over. Many yeah. times. In fact, uh, you, you'll notice that the uh, okay, to hear that. Okay. all these bookshelves have grown, and they're much higher than they were originally. Uh, so they were they were built by volunteers to make them higher to contain even more books. So, are there any other questions, or we could always just have refreshments at time? Yes, just a comment. Uh, Jenny Hauser, granddaughter of Charles Hauser, has already read your book. Oh, she loves it. Told me to say thank you, and she would like to meet you someday. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So let's. Thank you. Thank you. So again, um, now that break is done presenting, we can turn the air conditioning back on. Yes. Um, because we can't hear when the air conditioning. Is on. Peter, can we get one more question? Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, you know, since you mentioned the James J. Hill Library, our Canadian immigrant capitalist, uh, you know, that makes his presence in our state well known, I'm wondering if you have a take on the silence that uh, the closing of that library has been greeted with. I, I don't see any of our civic uh, leaders taking any kind of position to reopen that space or do anything creative at all. Well, I, I, I really uh, haven't been following it. I mean, I haven't, I haven't heard anything new about that. I mean, it, it was not a, it's not a public library. I was there a day before closing and I spoke to the assistant director and she said they were pretty confident about a five million dollar fund that was going to help them pre prevail. Oh. Oh. You mean it would reopen then? Probably come. Or in some context, yeah. Um, well, I went down and bought a coffee cup, uh, you know, figured I needed a little help. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what I can do. Well, we, have a, we, we, we have a donation. You got a, you right got a coffee cup you can sell me too, Peter? Like, okay, there you go. So, um, <laughs> so again, Clarence is going to turn the air conditioning back on. This is pretty, 
crowded group of people that haven't sure, turned off tonight. Um, there are books back here that Greg will be happy to sign. They're $15. Um, and there are refreshments, so please stick around and, and visit. And if you do have stories, tell us. We want to lecture stories. Again, great. Thank you.